We're brand new every day, but let's not be clueless. The world is always changing around us as we are changing. And that ad adaptive, steerable component gives me hope. Welcome. All right, man. Welcome to the pod. I'm excited. I, uh, I have, I, I can't even say medium level, low level knowledge on brain stuff. I've read some books. When I was younger, when I was 18 years old, I had a traumatic brain injury, skateboarding, uh, brain hemorrhaging and, and all that stuff. Um, so it kind of led me to be a little bit more interested than your average person. Yeah. Um, but I'm fresh off of reading your book, heard a couple of your podcasts and stuff like that. I'm very excited to Thanks, have this man. conversation. Thanks for having me on. We've already been jamming before with this, I know. <laughs> this hit record. So yep. just been, we just already been liking the vibe already, brother. Yeah, we got a good thing going. Yeah. Um, so I want to jump into like, you know, on this pod, like a lot of the stuff that I do is um, hearing people's stories and like figuring out how somebody becomes a great entrepreneur, athlete, all these different things. But I don't know anything about how you become a neurosurgeon and all the different, well, I know that's not just it, but yeah. all the stuff you're doing, you've now been, you're an author, you're obviously a neurosurgeon, you travel all over helping people and doing stuff like that. And you were on a TV show as well? Yeah, I did this thing on uh, Fox and I was like a co-host and Mike Tyson was on my right and yeah. I think somebody else, you know, a couple other. And all of a sudden people are like, how'd you pop up that high without an agent? I was like, I, just, I drive the LA freeways. Like, yeah. I mean, I can, I, I teach my kids. I got three teenage boys. I said, what's over here and what's over here? What's the intersection of this? Yeah. And just on the grid of Los Angeles, I grew up, you know, I grew up off the 605. I was talking to one of your guys here about 605, 91, just this nondescript, you know, strip mall way out there. But you take 91 West and you get to, you know, you get to Compton. I actually went to Compton Community College and wow. you see how like, you know, it's not like there's a wall or a certain set of trees that says this is Compton yeah. or this is not. You just they're just exits off the freeway. Yep. These four are Compton, these four are this. I just like seeing how like um, so much talent has popped out of this creative city, and yeah. it's not always. It rarely is from Hollywood Central. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. And so, for me, the journey like how do you become a brain surgeon is um, well, there's two ways. You just work your tail off. Yeah. But in my opinion, that makes for a conventional uh, communicator or a person who can connect with people who need brain surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And number two, uh, it's a hands thing. It's a performance thing. Yep, yep. It's not physics. It's flying the space shuttle. Yeah. That's one thing you talked about in the book that I oh, thought yeah. was never, I've never thought about it that way. It's like just the amount of creativity and the amount of, it's not, a lot of people think, I think, because People will say there's literally a saying, you don't have to be a neurosurgeon to know that blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And like they think it's these like bookworm yeah. sort of people. I don't want to be uh, smart. I want to be badass. Yeah. I don't want to be Einstein. I don't want to be Captain Sully landing that thing on the Hudson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I met that dude. Yeah. And it really helped me understand like I was feeling like, man, I've been, and we'll get back to how I became a brain surgeon, you know, just let it drift, bro. Yeah, we'll but, just flow around. But when I saw this dude and he was so composed and he was in KTLA, one of the rare people I said, you know, I, said, I wanted to say hello to him. Just start, try to read the energy of somebody who does that, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, uh, he looked like he was struggling, man. And it actually gave me a lot of peace that it's not all hero work. Like yeah. all those patients I've tried to help, all those patients that I've hurt. Yeah. Not complication. It's not oop stuff. You yeah. just can't get it to zero. You're flying to the moon. You will crash planes. Yeah. And so this dude was the same way. He's like, you know, he's, he's got PTSD, he's an alcoholic. <laughs> yeah. And everybody's like, I wish I could be Captain Sully. He's yeah, like, are you yeah, sure, yeah, man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want that. Yeah. And I've had some experiences like that with my patients where, like, I wrote about it where, like, you know, you cut out half, half the brain on a, yeah. like, on a girl and yeah. wake up parallel. You just, and um, you don't want to be there. Yeah. It doesn't matter they ask for it. It doesn't matter. They all are happy about it. What does it take out of you, right? Yeah. And that's what I got from Captain Sully. So whenever people say brain surgeon, I emphasize surgeon. Yeah. Uh, we want somebody who can handle the crisis, who can be inventive yeah. when there isn't a playbook. It's not like you get better because you're faster at changing the engine. Yeah. We, we're sculptors. I yeah. take it farther with a machete. Maybe you don't. Yeah. Maybe you go early with the with the scalpel or the exacto knife. There's a lot of ways to reveal yeah. the sculpture, and that's what you're doing with tissue. You're stitching it. You're moving. You're parting it. You're dissecting it. Yeah. And some people, they just, you know, like you know, I, I'm an LA guy, so I should be a Lakers guy. I am, but you see, like Kawhi Leonard, you're like, is he even 
trying as hard yeah. as you can, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. there's an efficiency to the movement. Yep. And that's what a capable, any surgeon, not just brain surgeon, yeah. a, knee surgeon, they're just, oh, it looks like it's in slow-mo. Yeah. And it's 60% of the moves somebody else had to do. Somebody's chipping, 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 hacking, and they're, there's a backhanded blade, yeah. and there's a forehanded blade, like a paintbrush. You don't yeah. just paint down. Yeah. You're painting left and right. And so surgery was always something that captivated me because I felt like I could separate myself from the brainiacs yeah. by, having, by having something indescribable with the flow and the moment under pressure and stuff like that. And that's what, that's what pulled me to it. Yeah. Did it start with like, like what was the first, what were you first inclined to do? Did you start going to medical school? Did you know that brain surgery, like how does it evolve into what you are? Got a lot of trouble in L.A. Mm-hmm. Wanted to get out of LA. Yeah. Got into Berkeley. Loved the hippie culture up there. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. still love it. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not so much in the tech world, but I am in the hippie world. I mean, I used to live in Oakland, San, you know, San Francisco, Berkeley. Yeah. Um, I dropped out of college there because it was all classes. Yeah. I don't want to. I don't want to fill in scantron bubbles for you know. I just yeah, was. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you can party. Out, you know, the raves were popping in San Francisco. You could do all of that or. Study. So I dropped out for two years. I was a security guard. Nice. And then I met a, a woman who's my wife and the mother of my kids. Um, and uh, decided, I, you know, I, you know this, it's not that because of her only that I wanted to take it a different direction. Yeah. I, was fe- I was seeing that I was getting as much as I could have out of being a security guard. You know, like that was cool. I learned a lot about people, but I wanted to add to that. Yeah. And uh, so I got into medical school, didn't like it. Classes, 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 yeah. classes. And then I remember the first day I stepped into L.A. County, which is the big general hospital over there. Yeah. That soap opera used to open with that too, but it's in Boyle Heights. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like, it's like, it's a city. Yeah. I spent one night in there. My brother fractured his <laughs> neck, and I spent one night in that emergency room. You got an active room, family, it man. it was wild. Oh, they had gunfire go it off. Was, Gangs came in one yeah. time in the early 90s, shot some people up. And when I got there, they had us go through a metal detector. I was like, yeah. finally, I'm being in, in, <laughs> let into an interesting place. Yeah, they got yeah, a metal yeah. detector before you go in the hospital God. for the doctor. Yeah. And over there, I was just like, everything is here. Yeah. Pain, suffering, triumph. Some of the most talented people. The technicians were, some of them were ex-cons and they had another opportunity. I mean, like everything in an intense box. So yeah. it was like this, I, I, I want to be a student of all the interactions. Yeah. Yep. And uh, surgery was the way to get into that. And then uh, in San Diego, I did my brain surgery training and then popped off to the side a little bit and got a PhD also. Yeah. And then when I got my job here at City of Hope Cancer Center 10 years ago, they were just just so forward thinking and so visionary. Yeah. We'll pay you a full salary, try to invent medicine half the time and do surgery half the time. Yeah. Like lose yourself into cutting things out and then trying to fight them in a Petri dish. So you can you can come up invent a new medicine like you don't we don't you know just you don't in you know like iPhones don't grow on trees well yeah. medicine used used to and still yeah. you know still some can be extracted from trees in the Amazon yeah but these days we invent medicine yeah, I mean, yeah. imagine inventing something that makes your your friend's mom live longer right yeah. so I I got the rush on that so the last ten years that's what I've been doing is and then that then that led to some awareness like man a lot of folks they don't even have the medicines we have here mm-hmm. our throwaway medicine our you know, we have five iterations that are better. Like yeah. the basic World Health Organization medicines didn't exist elsewhere. Yeah. And just like that, they didn't have basic gear for cutting and operating. Yeah. So that pivoted into some stuff. And then my kids got older and this book happened. It, you know, I got into some agencies here and, um, and then in New York. And then as we were talking about, the book did okay here. Yeah. But um, a person named Venetia Butterfield from Penguin bought the book here, changed the title. Changed the cover design. Yeah. A couple months ago, I'm rolling out there with my 13 year old, thinking, this is brilliant. A book tour in London. Yeah. You don't have to think about the next thing. This is it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like the first day, she's like, you're number 32 on Amazon. I was like, what? That's wild. And What's the I, name? There's a t- totally different name. Yeah. What's over, it called? Over, over here, it's called Neurofitness. Over there, it's called Life Lessons from a Brain Surgeon. Now, over there, it's not uh, preachy to say life lessons. Yeah. If she to say life lessons to me, I'd be like, who are you to tell me about life lessons? Yeah, man, but I, I see why thing. that could be a little bit more enticing. You know, and what I mean? the subtitle was popping: the new science and stories. Yeah. of the brain. Yeah, that's good. Here they didn't put the word stories in. Yeah, and the way I was writing the stories was when I got my, you know, the first time I ever wrote anything was for Vice. Yep. 
What was that one called? The time I it, let someone die? Yeah, right? Thank yeah. you so much yeah. for remembering <laughs> that. I had to argue with them because they're like, no, you don't write the title. I was like, what do you mean? I wrote the thing. Yeah, they're yeah, like, yeah. no, we edited. I was like, no, man. <laughs> yeah. And they're like, and I was like, just think about that. The first time I let someone die. Yeah, it's perfect. Like, I made the call. Yeah. Like, I'm going to let I'm gonna let you fade. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, the it's neck, so wild. Right? There's so much in that one, like, sentence. You know what I mean? Thank but I get you. it. That's why, like, yeah, I get it. That's creativity. Now yeah. I'm like, now I'm trying to surround myself with the most creative people because I realize, no, I got a lot of juice. I got a lot of content. I got a lot of stories. But I don't see it. I'm so deep into my yeah. world that... I, I need somebody talented to be like, wait, 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 I see what you got. Trim this here, this title. You yeah. may not like it. Trust me, out here in London, it'll work. Yes. When I landed on that, you know, when I, I landed in LAX, which is my home, my mind, you know, because it's, it's sort of like the portal for me. For to sure. The world. For sure. And uh, they were like, oh, you are officially and forever the Sunday Times, London best selling author. Gosh. I was like, life changing. That's man. huge. Isn't man. that? Just from the, she just like, Pulled me out of something, and yeah. pop, I mean, I mean, that's what I, I never. I mean, seriously, I like having this epiphany last couple months. That's what the creative world is. That yeah. it's not just about the talent; it's about the the team yeah. that puts essential pieces together. Yeah. No matter how much you think you can shine, it may not get to the eyes and ears. Yeah, and somebody's got to know the landscape. Like, look, this is a great book idea you have. This is saturated. Take this, pivot it this way, yeah. and it's fresh. Yeah, it's so true, man. It's mentorship, bro. And it's hardly ever the, you know, it's rare that the, it's almost like the relationship between like a, a, an artist that has some potential and a great producer. It's like hardly ever is it the same person. One person has to truly live it and be in it and represent it, and then the other person has to see how you could translate that to the world. You know what I mean? I, I never believe that because in my world, yeah. academics, surgery, medicine, even though I respect my team, yeah. even though when things go well, it's the team's success, and when they don't, it's my fault. Yeah. You're, you're kind of driving everything. In yeah, the operating yeah, yeah. room, even yeah. the anesthesiologist, you're like, hey, can you give them some more? Some, you're keeping an eye on them if you're doing a tricky case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when you get an anesthesiologist that can hold their own yeah. and fly that part of the plane on their own, that gives you a lot more bandwidth. Yeah. So there's, it just, but, but my world has always been a bit dominant for the surgeon. For sure, for sure. And this like one- being a CEO. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like you have talented people, but you're always- But the creative thing? Yeah. It's 50-50. Actually, yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and say I'm 49. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That somebody um, matched m the juice I have inside yeah. me yeah, yeah, yeah. and said, okay, okay, you got some raw stuff here. I know the whole landscape because uh, what, what, what happens is like, you know, m my life is good, man. I mean, yeah, my my got three teenage boys. They're healthy, so I don't have any more prayers. You yeah, know, yeah, yeah. the uh, but like, it's not about that title, but it just it gets you out into so many other worlds. Yeah, and I tell my boys, don't worry about people seeing you, man. The, what's interesting about doing different things is you see other people. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see, you climb that mountain to look out and be like, whoa, look at over there. I, I'm not, this year, my oldest boy, eighteen, we went to Bolivia to a children's hospital. Had lunch with my literary agent in Manhattan. Yeah. Uh, went to the Grammys just once. Just, just like, look at that. <laughs> my God, it was amazing. Yeah. And, and then we went to uh, some private clubs and some talks in London. Yeah. And this it's is incredible. my life. I love you, son. It's a big world out there. You don't have to be like Pops. Yeah. Check it. It's like, I'm excited about life. Yeah. And, Especially uh, at that age to have access to just see that many different types of life. Ugh, it's so... I, I would love to, you know, for me, like when I moved to LA at 18, mm. it was like, I'm from small town, Ohio. It was like, whoa, like, I don't even know if I can adjust to this. I thought I might have to move home. So at that early age to see that many different types, I feel like it would also make you be able to handle anything and know where you want to go a little clearer. You know what I mean? Adaptive. Yeah. Never passed his depth, never overwhelmed, moving through so many different spaces. To me, that's I mean, I'm not teaching him algebra and stuff. Yeah, yeah, People yeah. are like, he's going to be doing homework with them. No. Yeah. I'm yeah. like, but you'll, you do that. Yeah. That's all you. He'll figure that part out. Yeah. Just get him out in different spaces, man. Yeah. What about, the one thing I'm fascinated by too is like, and did it or did it not happen this way? Was there like a first time you ever did brain surgery moment where like, here, your hands are on the steering wheel? Mm. Do you remember what that was mm. like? Yeah. Um. That's a good question, brother, because I've been thinking about that for a story for my, my next book. Yeah, I can't wait for that next book. Yeah, man, yeah. 
So again, everybody thinks it's like like the first maneuver, mm -hmm. but it's not the maneuver. It's should I even be here? Yeah. So check this out. It's illegal now, but way back when, two uh, thousands. Uh, the neurosurgery trainees, the brain surgery apprentice, uh -huh. you know, like the, uh, uh, the residents, yep. we could make the call to take a trauma patient back while the professor was driving in. Mm -hmm. To no get other... started? Yeah. Okay. But, I mean, the... right. Yeah, to get started. Yeah, I mean, that's the, yeah. But what if you got started and the professor's like, what, what are you doing? Yeah, man? yeah. So the judgment to cut or not to cut, yeah. that's, that's the thing that changes you. Yeah. So I was 27. Jeez. No other resident, not the heart surgery trainees, not the other ones. They can't make that call on their own. They got to wait till the professor, their boss, yeah. is on site and says go. Yeah. But because neurosurgery is so time sensitive, I remember saying, no, this is classic, right? A little bit like, you know, rest in peace, the, the, uh, Natasha Richardson with the epidural when she was snowboarding and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, with all respect, uh, you know, Liam Nielsen's wife, that's how actually I got on this the, the TV gig here in, in hometown Los Angeles. Yeah. But there are those kind of like injuries where you're like, uh, I got 15 minutes. There's not a lot, but I got 15 minutes. It's not a tricky surgery, but I got to take the, the, the shell off the coconut and let it breathe. And yeah. then the professor comes in. That was legal and allowed and saved many lives. Yeah. Um, but that one first time I took somebody back and then the anesthesiologist is like 65. I'm 27. Yeah. Nurses are 45. And they're just like, give me that look. Like, <laughs> Good boy, luck, kid. You Good better luck. be right. That was the part. So everybody yeah. keeps thinking it's going to be some moment. Well, it was a bleeder. Yeah. Like, Man, they've made our world so cheesy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, they yeah. got the people telling the stories. They've never been in the firefights. Man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They haven't done the tours. Actually, they're telling the stories because they couldn't make it in the in the building with yeah, the hard work. Yeah. They they use that as a pivot out of surgery. Yeah, I'm I'm in the surgical world. You know, so now I feel like I, I've earned the right to tell a few intimate stories. So that first time, I felt like a surgeon was. All right, trauma crany. When you say that. They have a backup room in the operating rooms. Uh -huh. Backup squads sitting there eating lunch and stuff. They're like, okay, trauma cranny. Yeah. And then you walk in and you're like, I've been a doctor for 13 months. And you see a squad of people, 40s, 50s, 60s, you yeah. know? Yeah. They're like, all right, because this is your call to make within the system. Yeah. And that's when you realize what you've just been handed. Yeah. Right, and that's where you get the PTSD, and that's where you yeah. get all the issues with Captain Sully. Everybody's thinking, "Oh, did he press switch number one?" And uh, and he was like, "He's like, just should I go for the airport? Should I put it down the water? Should yeah. I go for the airport? Should I put it down the water? Yeah. Should I roll this trauma crany back, or should I not roll this trauma? It has nothing to do with the hand. It has to do with making that call when it's like you don't even know yeah. the fact." Uh, the full facts and details are so not even the picture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It just becomes an instinct. Yeah. And uh, and you just you just can't win when you're put in those situations. So I think it, my what, elite surgeons. Yeah. Uh, you know, Hurt Locker, where that you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Uh, uh you know, uh, Catherine Bigelow. I think that's her name. Directed it because she's just. She, she caught all of the energy without saying male director, male. You know, just yeah, stop with the boxes, man. She did, yeah. She yeah. caught it, right? Yep. But he's, he's really not functional in any other way other than that environment. Yeah. You know, you saw him in the grocery stores and he's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of the surgeons were like that. Male, yeah. all, all, all genders, all everything. Yeah. Some of, it's a, it's a brain that draws to that, yeah. wants to carry that weight wants to deal with the ramifications yeah so it's so most surgeons uh most doctors will never save a life yeah i mean they'll be on a team that gives certain medicines and most surgeons these days if you're operating on most parts of the body death is not really at risk on the table so the ones who take on a challenge where the patient can be lost yeah they're different yeah and what I, do you I'm, think that I'm is? proud of myself to be in that group what is that difference like well, I, I got into I got into this topic with somebody else, and it's like like some people who are sloppy at driving a car, like an SUV, mm -hmm. but you get them on a motorcycle and they're just they're slick with it. Yeah, yeah. So unless the stakes are there, the talent isn't elicited. Yep. 
So I think, like, I used to tell people, like, I'd be a horrible general doctor. Like, kids coming in with coughs, I'd be like, you're fine, you're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But on Wednesdays, when I know the stakes are high, it's, it's, my, it's like, it's, it's a meditative kind of thing. Yeah. On, me- on Wednesdays, I'm not thinking about, it's one of the rare times I'm not thinking about my family and stuff yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. you know? So that, that singular focus it, it is cathartic, and I think... It, it almost becomes a thrill and an addiction in itself. Yeah, yeah. That's the moment that you um, are most yourself in yeah. some ways. Did you feel that right away? Like if you go back to that first one when you made that scary decision, what were your feelings walking out of the office that day? Did you feel like, wow, this is my future? Or were you like, oof, this is going to take some time? No, I, actually, I was like, ugh, yeah. I love this. Because yeah, okay. it, it was messy. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't. Um, it wasn't uh, X, Y, Z, cut on the left, you know, yeah. A, B, C. It wasn't formulaic. Yeah. It was muddy. It was nuanced. It was imperfect. Yeah. And I was like, I, 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 like, I actually like this kind of discomfort. I, I don't want the discomfort of getting the late night call, like, from the kid. Yeah, you yeah, know, like, yeah. I'm not saying I like all kinds of anxiety, but there's a certain, there's a certain anxiety that, that heightens me. Yeah. Um, and that that was the thing that I liked most about it, because I mean they I mean they can teach everybody to get through most of the steps. Yeah, yeah. They they take surgeons without ever seeing them cut. Yeah. It's like picking quarterbacks without seeing them throw. Yeah, that's wild. Ballerinas without seeing them do anything. Yeah, right? it's kind so, of scary. Yeah, well, that, that's <laughs> you know in, I mean? that's in book two. But yeah. uh, that that uh, yeah, that that muddy but weird anxious feeling. Like I felt like no, this is a real opportunity to both understand people and thereby understand myself. Yeah. Like under these weird pressures, I'm gonna figure out who I am. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, and that was that was the hook. I'm still doing it. And how did that first one go? The first one was a success when you made the decision. Uh, no, it wasn't. No, but it wasn't you. It wasn't on you. But it, the the professor said this should but should have been a trauma cranny. Yeah, you made the yep, right yep, call. Yep, yep. Yeah, you should have flown to the airport. You 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 came in short. Yeah, but it was still the right call going back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, That's and wild. that. Yeah, yeah, not different. What a wild first way, though. Whoa, you know what I, I mean? know, man. I was saving that story for the next book, and you oh, got, man, it, I got out of it out of you. I mean, it's good that it wasn't your fault, but I mean, to have it be hit with that first one mm. is it turns out that way. Yeah, and Gosh. so again, it's the imperfect judgment. It's a risk that can never get to zero. Yeah, you know. Yeah, um, and, and that was. I, uh, this might be going too in depth, but is that one of the ones where you remove the section of skull because the brain is swelling? Is yeah. that what it was? Got yeah. it, got it. Because yeah. you wrote, you write about it in the book, and we've heard these stories, um, and you just kind of mentioned it with that famous story, but like how people can have these head injuries and be talking and everything's fine, mm-hmm. and the next minute they are gone. Right? Is mm-hmm. that how, I mean, is that an accurate? A um, lot of different types of brain injuries. Yeah. But... Uh, because the skull doesn't stretch yeah. and the brain is a little bit pliable, think of it as like 90 billion microscopic jellyfish, yeah. um, that first pop that knocks you out, there could be, a, and that happens in boxing, yeah. uh, there could be a little vessel that's torn. Yeah. So you wake up from your concussion, right? Because that's like an electrical jolt. Yeah. You drop your phone, it glitches out. You press on, it comes back on. Yeah, that's yeah, a concussion. Yeah. Yeah. But that artery's there. And if this is the skull and this is the surface of the brain yeah. it starts to collect blood in between yeah. and since the skull doesn't stretch at some point the newly collecting blood will knuckle into your brain yeah. and cause the injury so there's there's a couple of different things going on yeah. There, yeah it's just wild that sometimes like for instance when i had mine i had an epidural hematoma and i had a concussion on both sides from my brain rather than a fractured mm-hmm. uh, skull and I was in a medically induced coma for four days. And, but mine was right up to the point of almost having to remove the piece of skull. Well, that's the call. Yeah. You don't time that trauma cranny call. Yep. You wait 15 minutes, same person. It's too late because now that clot is knuckled too far in the brain. Yeah. You, you make the call early. You get in there and you open up the coconut, let the brain breathe a little bit, let the blood drip out. It's not a technically challenging surgery. Yeah. The, the question is, should we or should we not? And when should we and how much should we hurry? Yeah. So a matter of timing, not technical ability, yep. uh, saved you. And that, that's a crazy story. Four days in, in chemical coma. I've done all of that stuff. Yeah. We still do. And uh, you don't always know who's going to do well. Yep. So everybody gets a shot. Yep. I don't make a shot. I don't make the call. 
I mean, we used to have prisoners come into the hospital. We, man, you know, you just, when well, those drapes are on, it's 100%. Yep. There's never 98, 99. No. When the drapes are on, that flesh is cut. I'm a hundy. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. And there's a, that's an interesting thing about dissociating yourself from who that person is underneath the drape. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's I a lot to learn there. Yeah. And I had a, that's why I think I don't, I don't take care of kids here in the States. Um, I do internationally. Uh, do children's brain surgery yep. with a buddy of mine in San Diego, but I found it myself not wanting to know who the kid was under the drape until yeah. afterwards. You know, yeah, you yeah. get in a lot of your own, like, if you get cuddly and cute with the kid and then you got to operate on them, are you are you flying less hard? Yeah. Are you double guessing? I mean, there's a lot of complexity to that. Yeah. None of that is put out there. Yeah. They've just they just got us playing the operation game and sleeveless scrubs and. <laughs> You know, like yeah. it, they just made us silly in a world that is so raw, yeah. and so nuanced. Yeah. So hopefully, I'm in. I'm trying to change that. Well, and that's what I. So that's I think part of like the core of my biggest question is, you know, if something goes wrong technically, I'm guessing you can go back to the research. You can go back to the book. You can kind of do some research. How do you strengthen that part? How do you make sure that you're not getting jittery that you're not second guessing that you're not like how do you strengthen that confidence mm. part of it all that's a that's a that's brilliant because that's what separates people yeah now just the sports analogy i'm it's, we, we, do, we can do ballet music sports fly, whatever you want to do something where it's brain plus body yeah, yeah something where uh again einstein is great but sully is who i look up to yeah, right yeah, yeah of course so um some people are better at uh, just naturally better at mm-hmm. it. Some people freak out less. Mm-hmm. That's good. But you need to freak out a little bit because without it, you're not pulling all your talent out of your quiver. So it's like this weird thing like you want to feel the nerves. Yeah. You just don't want to have the nerves rattle your decision making and performance. Yeah. And that's such a thin line. And that's such a thin line. And that's why you get some quarterbacks, they're beaten. They're beating everybody, throwing through the little football that's swinging around. Yeah. I mean, they're beating you in practice. Yeah. But the last two minutes, when you put it all together, stresses on the line, movement changes. Some people just happen to be better. Yeah. It's like that for surgeons as well. Yeah. And I think what happens is, uh, you can't be afraid of the of the big case. Yeah. And so again, in surgery, we don't get paid more for the big cases. It's not like it's a natural draw to go to that. Yeah. The people that go to that go for, go go for the glory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's not like it's cowboys. They're, it's cancer patients saying, you know, cut this thing out of me that's eating me up from the inside. Yeah. And you discuss it with them. There are going to be some risks. Yeah. And some of them rather, um, you know, some of them they just they they want that the the, the psychological benefit of for once driving their life rather than having the clinic and the hospitals and the doctors do they say I, no, I, I want to do it on my term yeah 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 so some of these cancer operations they all the cancers they grow differently yeah. it's not like cutting the same square out of the yeah. you know flan or whatever it's yeah. they grow differently the battles differently so what i do as a i like to think of my i'm always uh it, it's sort of like situational crises that i create in my mind if I went left and I see the blood vessel, okay, what if I came here blindly and I didn't see this? Yeah. And it just popped on me. Yeah. What would I do? Maneuver one, maneuver two, maneuver three. So you have to actually have some skill. Yeah, for sure. That's good. To <laughs> Not know. just guts. Yeah. Right? <laughs> but That's then, good. but you have to, uh, you have to like stay sharp with the skill when you don't need the skill. It's a weird yeah. thing. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. why are you in your backyard just training when there's no enemy? Yeah. Why are you running maneuvers of how you'd land this plane? If I, if I'm, you know, the, that extra running those things in your mind, yeah. uh, you know, like like that. I don't know. I don't know if this connects, but like they're talking about like training for golf. You got to imagine your uh, like this is the thing that matters the most. Yeah. Like I do with my kids when we go to the batting cages, bottom of the night. Like, step away. Let one or two go by. Now yeah, walk yeah, up yeah. and see if you can give me the hit when I need it, yeah, not just yeah, in yeah. rhythm. Big time. Right, time, so that's yeah. where we're surgeons. I, I, I daydream about this stuff, and the, before the, the night before a case, I rotate that tumor. It's like my, it's my addiction. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. Like wanting, wanting to defeat an enemy that I can never, completely win against. Yeah, and that that's the hook. Yeah. So for me, uh, there's a bit of aptitude, there's skill, there's uh, planning for, uh, scenarios, situational maneuvers. And so then that's there for you. Like, okay, I'm, okay, I'm, uh, uh, 
you know, you have nerves. It's not like my, it's, you know, this thing like, oh, his blood pressure, he's, his heart rate must be 60 while the world is falling apart. I'm not sure that's true, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think everybody's situa- heart rate is up when they're under threat. That's just biological. Yeah. But what, what they do is that doesn't lead to uh, decreased performance. Yeah. And, and separating that is, uh, you know, is that, it's that elusive thing, man. Yeah, big time. Do you do like meditation or do you have any like practical steps that you do to exercise that separation? Um, I, you know, I have my own, my own ritual. Mm-hmm. So first of all, I'm not sure who, who said this quote, but it's Lombardi or somebody else. But, um, f- you know, fatigue makes cowards out of us all, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, and so first thing is, you know, you, you kind of have to, you have to do light weights and stuff. So if you're operating for four hours yeah. and that neck pain, that fatigue kicks in, yeah. it changes, it changes things. Yep. So like, I think first you have to be um, physically fit for the challenge. Uh, and then second, you have to be uh, prepared for the incidentals. If it goes, I was, what makes a good surgeon? Somebody who can fix complications. Yeah. Yeah. It goes well, man. They don't even remember me. I think yeah. sometimes I see them in the grocery store. They're like, I don't see something. I'm <laughs> Why fine. Guy staring at me? <laughs> but it's the ones that, okay, they, you know, airplane landed, the, you know, the, the landing gear wasn't there. Now we got to fix it. We, the ones you have to use those maneuvers on, yep. not just in that first operation, but they wake up and you're like, like I got to take you back in yep. a couple of days yep. and yep. do some more tinkering. And they look at you like, what? Mm-hmm. And that's a, that's, they have faith that in somebody else's hand, the complications would have been greater. So yeah. I, I uh, meditation's an interesting thing. I don't meditate in the operating room, uh-huh. but when I pull in Wednesday into my, you know, little spot I got underneath this tree in my mind where I, I roll in, there is power in, I don't know what people are thinking. Like, I don't know what mindfulness is, yeah. but a few controlled deep breaths yeah. is our built-in Valium and Xanax. Yep. And there is a pathway, there's an, actually two nerves. Yeah. that can control the electricity in your mind, um, measurable. Yeah. I mean, this is not sci-fi stuff. It's stuff like, you know, we could get into it some other day, but yeah. deep meditative breathing can actually calm you down yeah. psychologically and, and the electrical activity in your mind. So I, do I have those little rituals? I've got the, the shoes I like to wear. You know, there's a little bit, because yeah, there's pedals and stuff, because we use all four limbs. Yeah. That's why I got a over here, I got a blade, I got a drill pedal over here and little things. So it's a little bit like being a drummer. Yeah. And so I've got these old dress shoes that I keep resoling. So the leather on top is real soft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, you know, so I don't get foot fatigue. So I've got my rituals. I've got my simulation of crises in my mind. Yeah. I've got to rotate the tumor around the night before. I've got the 10 deep breaths when I pull into my spot. And I think all of those things uh, that get you into that frame of mind where you are if something were to get complicated, you are at your best at that moment. Yeah. And when you look back at it, you can say, look, man, I, I, ha- I handled that as best I could. Yeah. It literally sounds like, if, I, if we didn't describe what we were describing right now, it sounds like you're like a pilot, uh, NFL quarterback. All of it. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Thank you. Yeah. It's, Thank you. it's amazing. Ballerina hitting the, I mean, I went to the ballet. The Marinsky was in, you know, I took my mom and, and my wife and some friends, and you see them move. <laughs> They're no different than Saquon Barkley or Barry yeah. Sanders. Yeah, yeah, see, yeah. There's an efficiency to the movements. That's, I like to go to the ballet with my kids. We, of course, there's wonderful sound, but they get, like, when somebody makes a good move in sports, yeah. I'm like, they're doing the same thing, man. Yeah, so yeah, you start yeah, to yeah. respect other people's physical movements and efficiency under the lights. Yeah, yeah. It's that mastery stuff. Do you have, using that comparison, do you have any story or any moment that sticks out to you as like that moment when the pressure was on everything was against you and you threw that super bowl winning pass like or or is is it sort of blended in with a lot of stories like that i think it's i think it's mostly blended in yeah there's rarely one maneuver in in a patient that's losing altitude that oh fixes it all yeah yeah everybody likes to think like oh and you put the boop you did the one thing, and yeah. now it's all fine. Yeah. It's a series of maneuvers, and you get them up. Um, you get some altitude. And the maneuvers are done in cadence with the anesthesiologist, especially if it's like dealing with a, a vessel that's like a snake out of control. Yeah. You get your, first, you, sometimes you put your finger on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
and get it to stop spurting. And then you look over at the anesthesiologist and you say, hey, let's tank them up. Yeah. That means get the aquarium filled with blood, you know, get the body filled with blood that you lost. Yeah. Because you bleed out at half empty. You don't got to go, you don't have to go to zero. Got it. So you, okay, you say, okay, you tanked up. Then you do your maneuver. They're like, hey, we're getting low. Then you pause. And sometimes you might just keep putting your finger back on there because your, your throws aren't working. Yeah, yeah, Literally, yeah. your stitch throws. Yeah. And, then you, and so you have to work with the people that are in that room. So usually it's a series of maneuvers. And what you realize is um, uh, not, not, only, not only am I not bad at that, or maybe I'm better than others. Maybe, uh, maybe I can continue to get better at this and and offer this skill to patients who have the need and they request yeah. um, a dangerous surgery. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's when you start looking at, you know, now I'm 46, so you're taking me through like 15 years. Now I start looking around and saying, we, we want to be the ones that hurt, hurt patients the least. Yeah. There are operations that'll never get to zero. In our hands, maybe the complication rate or the death rate is 5%. You go across town or you go to... San Francisco or Stanford, and, or you go to New York, and over there it's 8%, 12%. So yeah. you take pride that in your hands, you can safely land more crashing yeah. airplanes. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. where the pride comes in. Yeah. So there's a strange competition, too, built in where you want to be better than anybody else for the patient, but it's also better than other surgeons. Yeah. So it's a, it's a... It's the kind of competition you're gonna have to feel bad about, right? Yeah. For a good, in the end, it's for a good cause. Yeah, that is wild. It's yeah. just, man, I, I, I got it from reading your book, but now talking to you, like, the comparison to sports is incredible, and I don't think that's um, clear always. Clear always. It's a lot looked at as like uh, schooling, you know, book smart, um, and then just I don't know inc how incredibly high the stakes are, and at the end of the day, you're operating on someone's brain and. In that one story, I read it actually last night, sort of prepping for this, but where you were talking about having to remove half of that girl's brain and just talk, even describing like scooping half of her brain out and putting it in a Petri dish. Like it's just, I don't know. You're, it, it's so high stakes and so unlike anything else um, on this side, even while on this side, it's so. And then you've got all those feelings and then there's like family praying outside. You know, yeah. you got to go change your clothes. We've got locker room. You gotta go outside and go talk to them, man. You gotta yeah. get it together. Yeah. That complexity, I'm so grateful to medicine, surgery, and science for yeah. letting me into their their deepest corners and their, to, to let me be a part of that and stay a part of that. Yeah. I'll always be a surgeon here, abroad. Yeah. Cause that's you know, you know, that's that's like that's the thing that made me um worthwhile to the society i don't know if that makes sense yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know like because yeah. i'm not sure otherwise i'd be a very constructive member of society i'm not <laughs> yeah. saying i'm gonna be tearing stuff up don't get me wrong but yeah, yeah. like this thing it gave me a a purpose yep. to shape my identity you know like i i'm not the, i don't have to i don't wear bling yeah yeah, yeah. pants are from costco i rock them i get thrift clothes i just there's a there's a you carry yourself differently yeah. when you know what you do, even if other people don't know you do it, man. For sure. It changed my, my energy yeah. to be allowed to exercise a skill in the service of other people. Right? Yeah. That's like, I mean, it changed the direction of my life. Man. Yeah. Just like this, you know, what this, this person did for me at Penguin in, in London, it's like, you know, you start to see yourself in a different light. Yeah. That, you, that regardless of what people have said about you, regardless of where you're starting out, you know, that you are new every day yeah. and that that all these chemicals and these, you know, the, the brain is filled with these 90 billion microscopic jellyfish, we call them neurons, but they're electric, they're throbbing. Yeah. It's not like, it's not like a heart muscle or a liver. Yeah. They move, they throb, they spray dopamine and chemicals at each other. And the best way I can describe it is like, it's like a swarm of birds in the sky. Yeah. That swarm is never the same. So it might be a bit dreamy, but biologically, you are new every day. Like, you could have something amazing to happen to you tonight, yeah. and you would be a new person the next day, right? Yeah, Let's yeah. say you win, some, you win, the, you win a Grammy. Yeah. The next day, you're different. Yeah. You lose a Grammy, the next day, you're different. Yeah. So I just feel 
like from what I've seen from my patients is they go to surgery, they wake up, oh, one of their arms isn't working. And they got a battle to get that arm back. Yeah. And when I saw like three months later, they got their arm back, I started thinking, that's with an injured brain with a cancer in it. Yeah, yeah. How have we been fed this thing about like, yeah. you know, like the, the brain is like, yo, creativity lives here and yeah. it's great. No, it's not. This, no, no. I got so many no's to say. Yeah. But but it's it's to it's not to tell you what to do. It's just to unblind you, yep. to see yourself in a new light and say, okay, uh, I got to own uh, what I'm in. Or okay, this is the first step to a five year process of extracting myself out of this situation. Yep. And somewhere in between, I, I mean, I you know, it's like I'm a deeply flawed person, you know, and um, understanding how dynamic the brain is yeah, yeah. and there's chemicals and electricity yeah. and like aurora borealis in there it just makes me feel like like no no triumph is forever but also no tragedy and no defeat is forever yeah, yeah, so yeah. you're like every i'm jacked for every day because of it and this yeah. that's part of the patience the neuroscience the my station in life my age in life my sons being healthy and teenage boys yeah, yeah, when yeah. you see them grow up and yeah they sit next to you and they're taller you're like I'm fine. Yeah, it's yeah. gonna be fine. Yeah, kids yeah. are fine. I'm fine. Yeah, so all of that's coming together for me right now in my mid forties, and I just feel really good about it. Yeah, that's incredible. I just love hearing your because you almost sound like it almost sounds like spiritual, mm -hmm. and I'm sure that you are, but but you see it from a totally different angle, and that's what's so fascinating. And I think that I like I love uh, you know I've read a lot of these meditation or self-helpy or all these books mm -hmm. and all these things. But I love trying to figure out why practically it's true. You know what I mean? It, it, but that's it though, right? Yeah. So that, no, no. do you mind if we dig no, in? No, no please. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, let's go. I didn't know if we want to move from the surgeon stories to this, but this is this is the thing that's, that the surgeon's, exp the surgical experience with the brain in particular yeah. has offered me these unique insights yeah. that I feel compelled to share with my loved ones yeah. when we all jam, when we hang out. Yeah. That is, it, it can't you can't be told what to do because there's there's eight billion individual brains forget where we live eight you're new every day let alone being the same as another skull you know a, a carcass with the brain throbbing and driving itself around yeah, right yeah, yeah. you're brand new and and for me if you tell people oh you know oh your blood sugar is too high you gotta lower that. What, that's not gonna persuade anybody. Yeah, we tell them, man, you putting the wrong gasoline in your pipes, man. Yeah, that's unleaded. You put lead it in. You, you're gonna burn out. You're gonna burn out the plumbing. Yeah, and that's what that does. Yeah. Diabetes. You, then you get leg issues, eye issues. You know, yeah. people need explanations. Yep. And so that's all I'm trying to do. Like people, are like, uh, I I just try to. Exp I don't care if people smoke cigarettes or don't smoke cigarettes, and I don't want that to come across as callous. Like, yeah. he said, I, I just want people to know. It can give you a series of diseases, yep. and especially after like you know you've had a couple of thousand, yep. and it's hard to just stop at a couple of thousand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, it's that if you know, I want the freedom to make bad decisions. Yep. Tell my kids that. Yep. But what what the problem is, we don't we haven't explained the most amazing thing about us. We know about our heart. Yeah. We know about like man, we got like we know more about our guts and thighs yeah. and our heart. And even though there's a lot of mystery of the brain left to be understood, the stuff in that book that I wrote, that's decades old. Yeah. It's decades old that if you open up the skull in a living person, because the brain doesn't feel. Yeah. That's wild, does. too. When and you talk about that, when you talk about like operating on people while they're awake. Brother, it's decades old. That's not like <laughs> new science from John D. L. Laboratory. No, what I'm saying is information that has existed has not bubbled up to our consciousness. Yeah. And we have failed as brain scientists and brain surgeons. This, somebody did this decades ago. And a little bit of tickle only on the left side. Some people hear music. They smell burnt toast. Yeah. They have like visions of spirituality. Somebody heard Kendrick Lamar. Mm -hmm. And it's, the question is, the one I always wanted to know was, so if you have, and there's this book about a nun who had a little tumor there and she didn't want it out because sometimes that area can make you, quote, hyper-religious. And she uh -huh. was really devout and passionate she's like wait a second that's, crazy. that's not a complication i want to have when <laughs> yeah. i will I'll be less connected yeah. with something or someone yeah and um and what i always thought about was those patients that see god they tend to see them of the faith they have been raised yeah well what about those quote undiscovered societies in the amazon where they're they you know they look up at airplanes 
Like if one were to do that awake brain surgery on them and they had never been taught about God, yeah. what would they see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Would they see mother nature? Yeah. You know, like would they see stars in the sky? Yeah. Like that kind of like question for me, that, that that's my buzz, you yeah, know, like yeah, to yeah. start and to be able to expr- explain that like some things are local, some things are global. Yeah. 90 billion neurons, they don't touch. Yeah. They, muscle cells touch, liver cells touch. The 90 billion neurons, little jellyfish with the 10,000 tentacles each, they reach for each other and they stop like lovers in a kiss and then they spray stuff. What do they spray? Dopamine, serotonin, all these kind of things. Yeah. And, you know, like if if one were to do cocaine, it's not cocaine going between that. Yeah. Cocaine's just releasing the dopamine. Yeah. But if we replace too much dopamine, if somebody's got low dopamine, they can become compulsive gamblers. Yeah. So I want to, I just, I actually want to just people to know it's not simple. There's no happy chemical. There's not one grape-sized reason for creativity. Yeah. And, and it's not to dispel the magic of the brain. It's actually to introduce the dynamic magic of the brain. Yeah. And so you wake up every day and you're like, wait a second. It's a wildfire of chemicals and electricity and throbbing microscopic billions and billions of jellyfish. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. When you, when you get to understand that, I think then when you wake up, you say, okay, I can do anything today. Yeah. And that's what like, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but the way I see it when I read books like yours is if somebody can have this traumatic injury or Mm. a tumor in their brain or all these things and make these crazy recoveries, does that mean that healthy people can also make crazy progress? Yeah. From from just, yeah. And I feel like we don't think about it that way. Exactly. You know, like I have a friend that says you don't have to get, you have to be sick to get better. That's good. Right? And like, yeah. meaning if you just... And you don't have to do all this stuff just so you can stay as smart as you were. Because a lot, of, a lot yeah. of people, when they get less young, older yeah. folk, they ask me like, how can we stay sharp like we were? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, so before, the answer is yes. Mm-hmm. So if you're, if you, you know, if you had Usain Bolt, where, what do you want to, like, we want to run faster until you run stairs, you know? Yeah. We know the answers when it comes to the conventional yep. flesh, if you will. Yep. But the thinking flesh needs to think. And there was this crazy experiment they did. I'm not even sure they're allowed anymore, looping back to pilots at Stanford. They gave an Alzheimer's drug to pilots who did not have Alzheimer's uh-huh. and had them do a bunch of simulation stuff. Uh-huh. And so they've got all these performance-enhancing drugs, yep. sexual-enhancing drugs. Yep. There's no doubt in my mind decades away there will be cognition, brain-enhancing drugs. People, there will be a black or legitimate market for enhancing the way we think. And that doesn't mean we turn it into some movie where we're doing math formulas. Yeah, yeah, I don't, yeah. yeah. don't want to do math. Yeah, everyone's looking for limitless, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. Or uh, Lucy where she was like, <laughs> yeah. the 80% of the brain's not used. No, we use all 100. Yeah. We, we don't use all 100 at the same time to be efficient, yeah. but all corners are used. So I, I do think that um, you don't have to be sick to get better. Mm-hmm. I do think we have under um, under explained how dynamic that universe is in our skull yeah. uh, for mood, for thought, for movement, for emotion. And I'm not. And with the caveat, we're all individual. I'm trying to be a little bit different than I was a day ago for me. Yeah. So that might mean reading about some complex surgery, but for somebody who hasn't read yet at all and they're 14 in a different country, it might mean just trying to read. And that's where that hook comes in, where like learning a new language or learning uh, learning to play a musical instrument, you don't have to get good at it. Just the process of trying to learn, that's the thing, that's that's the brain exercise, right? That's built in brain training, trying new things, thinking, pushing the creative boundaries. Something tomorrow that you didn't do yesterday. Is that why things like learning to play piano or ping pong or that stuff is, so good? Is it so good? Yeah, all of it. For every level. Yeah. Uh, again, the industry will want you to say it's a certain puzzle or a certain equation. Yeah. Uh, no, it's just a little bit more than you did yesterday. Yeah. That, that, and it's free. You can, you can read stuff. You can think stuff. You can go out. So a, a little bit more movement, a little bit more thinking. Yeah. And, you know, maybe a little bit more eating in a way that you're replacing the nutrients in your brain. Yeah. You know, that... You could you could lean more plants and fatty fish. Yep. That plus a little bit more thinking than you usually do, a little bit more living than you usually do, a little bit more being vertical than you usually do. Yeah. Steps in that direction. That's your built-in brain training, and it's free. Yeah. And would you say too? I, I want you. I want you to correct me here if I'm wrong. 
it also seems to me like we understand the body so well. And we understand like, hey, you do curls and you'll get bigger biceps, right? The brain, does, it doesn't seem like we understand that that well, at least on a mass level. Is the brain like a thinking machine the way that an arm is a lifting machine? Does that make sense? Is, yeah. is, is that comparison accurate or yeah. no? Yeah, what is the work a bicep does? Yeah. It contracts and then... When, there's, when this contracts here, there's a tendon connecting, it'll pull this up. Yeah. And the triceps will contract and bring it down. Yeah. So when the heart pumps, the liver filters along with the kidney, different things like that. Yeah. Um, the brain is, is thinking flesh, but it's thinking slash emotions slash yeah. instinct flesh. Yeah. Let me give you an example. You roll up somewhere, first peak, there's a, there's a snake, you jump. Yeah. That's instinctive emotional reaction. That's built in. You go up there the next time, you're like, oh, that's, that's Halloween, it's a rubbish name. Uh-huh. So that, 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 those frontal lobes in the front, that, this bossing out here that other animals don't have, yeah. it can work with your instincts yeah. or, or it can actually modulate your instincts. Uh-huh. We'll all learn, like, it's all right, man, that's a fake snake. Or, hey, this is okay, there's a railing here, we won't fall off. Yeah. A lot of people, their fear of heights is significantly less when there's a barrier. So you, that's your... That's the frontal lobes, the creative part, the magical part, the advanced part, the distinctive part. Modifying the thermostat of your emotions. And those emotions might be too high where you're a risk taker or they might be too different where you just feel bad even though there's nothing going wrong in your life from the outside in. And that's where thinking is the movement, is the activity of these two frontal lobes that that separates us and that, that makes us new every day. Yeah, I get that. And here's the other thing too is this this question might be a little confusing, but like, what percentage? Um, okay, let's just say we take out any like actual medical disorders, and we talk about your everyday person who's you know maybe a little anxious, maybe a little happy, maybe a little sad. What percentage can we train to think better, and what percentage is the way I am? Mm, I'm just a sad person. Versus, yeah. You know, what I don't have the say? answer for that. Yeah, I don't have the. And again, uh, I'm I'm trying to explain, but not fix everything. Yeah, yeah, if yeah. You, and sometimes, you know, sad people write amazing things. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I, I I'm not trying to make every. You know, what I'm saying like I just want people to see themselves in a new light and then steer it. Yeah. The fact that we are st- that we can steer our thoughts yeah. is what I would want people to walk away with it. Where you take it, brother? That's. Yeah. I look forward to your creative direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, there is a, a constitutional element uh, built in thermostat to how we react to things. Yeah. Um, and so I can't tell you that, like, out of the eight billion, five billion are set a little happy, and three are set a little. I don't think it. I don't think it works like that because yeah. if tomorrow there's a crisis, all our thermostats are set high appropriately. Yeah. Maybe 9-11, wherever, wherever people's example is in their mind where you can't forget something. Yeah. Uh, and then the question is, how, how good are, are we at tamping that down when the threat is gone? Yeah. That's what we're stuck with, yeah. is responding to threat, but then, man, it, the thermostat gets, got set high even though the threat is gone, right? Yeah. That's the anxious world that people talk about is the threat response despite the lack of obvious threat. Yeah. And then you go like, you know, I travel all over Central and South America and El Salvador, man, it's been just the murder, you know, the murder rates just through the roof. Yeah. People are doing their thing. So under threat, some are relaxed. Yeah. Not under threat, some are, you know, some are toxic and unhappy. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know those numbers and I, I don't know, I don't know what to do with that, you know, that's not really in my space. Yeah. But I do want all those people that might connect to that thought to say, I am steerable in how I respond yep. because just like I can ignore the plastic snake by thinking that threat away, yeah. I could in some ways try to think away the random rage I feel driving around LA for no reason, yeah, right? Yeah, so that, yeah. that your frontal lobes can steer your emotions. Yep. The, the degree to which and whether you choose to do it, that, yeah. that's in your hands. And do you think that's something you can strengthen like mm. a bicep? Yeah, I think so. I think that's where going back to things like meditation yeah, yeah. and you know, just being out in nature. That's where people are getting to with those things, that yeah. there are habits 
that empower you uh, to tamp down your anxiety yeah. if you choose that. And again, it's not yoga mats in Malibu. It's there's a built-in thing that lets deep divers drop their heart rate to 40, lets Buddhist monks drop their heart rate to 40. Yeah. The brain can control the body in ways it shouldn't be allowed to. Yeah. That un automatic nervous system is not supposed to be under the control of the brain. Yeah. And flip it around, the way you handle your body can actually control your thoughts. And that's where deep breathing comes in. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's an anatomical explanation for that. And there are papers out on that. That's, that's not, that's not uh, again, that's not science fiction or fluff, yeah. man. Yeah. That's, that's, a bi that's our built-in Xanax and Valium. We just don't know about it. Yeah. I think that's the most fascinating part. And I think that's like, it almost takes it full circle to how you will feel anxious going into a surgery and this is a life or death situation but you play that line of letting the the anxiety for lack of a better word just tell you how important it is but you don't lose focus where a lot of people in their day-to-day -day lives like i think even when you're talking about the person freaking out in road rage that's the person that the anxiety goes up and then they now let it control their emotions and that's going to cause you to get in a fender bender or flick that guy off that comes oh, and breaks yeah. your window, it leads to a whole different thing. And you're the epitome of not only having the knowledge, but knowing how to actually feel when something's serious and life or death, but not let it affect, you know, you use it to inform your next action as it's opposed to, word. right? Inform. But I've been on both sides, so maybe that's the, that's the thing. Like, yeah. I've had the, and I need to control myself better teenage years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I've had the, okay, if I can just, tamp it down, yeah. here's a place where it's cathartic and uh, can be used in a constructive way to help people. Yeah. And um, so so I don't know if I, my frontal lobes have steered it away yeah. versus putting it to use or inform myself into um, uh, you know, a better way of, of caring myself and, yeah. and contributing to this world. You know, I'm, I'm in my 40s, it's run, isn't gonna last forever, I work in a, a cancer center, you start thinking about, you know, first providing and then the impact you can make on the world. And then you just start thinking about like, you know, am I in the right space for my own mental health yeah. to enjoy, if I'm lucky enough to have a few decades ahead, what do I want to do um, that satisfies me? And fortunately, my work is both a thrill and it's so satisfying and it gives me such a sense of identity. Yeah. I, I don't, if I didn't have that, I don't think I'd be up here saying these things or writing those things yeah, you know yeah, and yeah. uh and in some ways all of that all of all of whatever the last 46 years have been with the boys and the misses and the, it's just uh, I, f I find myself liberated just in the last few months yeah being here and jamming with you has been just you know it's good like that man yeah thank you man okay here's my last few that'll lead us to this perfect question what a perfect time for the question not a perfect question uh from all of this that you've been through you've literally once again i, I for me, it's fascinating being in those. You've seen people not make it. You've seen people make insane recoveries. You've seen lives changed, I would guess, pretty often. What's the biggest thing that you've taken away from it? Like, how has it affected the way you live your life outside of the hospital? Uh, that's a good question, you know. I think the, the obvious answer people expect is, well, you, you know, you're a cancer surgeon. Yeah. Um, you must, you know, understand how li how precious life is and how randomly disease can strike. Um, I I I have take you know I have taken away that lesson also. Yeah. But the biggest lesson I've taken from all of this is that I could have been I could have been a very different person without my circumstances. So. Just let me let me layer that answer yeah, yeah, a little please, bit. Yeah. Like, I don't want any credit for what I've done. Mm -hmm. A lot of things went my way. Mm -hmm. I put work into it, but I'm seeing that you know I was born to the right family. Yeah. Like, <laughs> this, I love this country. Yeah. You know, like this gave me so much opportunity to where I can actually go to El Salvador. I can go to Ukraine and do surgery. So, like, as much as I'm talking about. You know, there's, there's this guilt that comes for patients who are, you know, some of the cancer survivors, they feel like, well, you know, I you know, I didn't do well with my cancer. I'm not a cancer survivor. Like, there can be a weird feeling of others have survived and I haven't. Yeah. So my life is steerable. 
but I've realized I have to be very thankful for just the right set of yeah. opportunities, environment yeah. that I fell upon or were given to me. Yeah. That just the best, you know, the best partner, Danielle, you know, best parents. Yeah. Got a great squad. Kids are just, oh my God. I mean, I like, you know, he, this, my older son is just, just like the most, uh, it, smart is not the right word because it's not just about smart. It's like you see him and it's just like, it, it's just like this energy, this charisma, right? Yeah. So unforced. And my wife and I were like, we didn't do that. People were like, oh my God, you guys are such a good parents. We're yeah, like, no, nah, right? we don't take any credit for that. Yeah. And so I've learned that there's that balance. Like I'm steerable, but yet very thankful for my fortunate set of circumstances because yeah. a lot a lot of people get these cancers and they don't, it just happens to them. Yeah. So it's that weird steer the components that I can, and, you know, and endure and enjoy yeah. the luck that's fallen upon me. And that's that balance I'm always trying to deal with. Yeah. But the steerable thing is good. If I'm doing great because I've been lucky, steer myself into savoring it. Yeah. If something tough has happened in my life, steer myself into enduring it. Yeah. So I'm st I'm still driving, but I'm adaptive. Yeah. Like you know, I'm, I'm, my my frontal lobes are driving my life this moment and this and tomorrow. But I'm adaptive to everything that's still happening in front of me, yeah. and that keeps it from being simple, like mindfulness of dishwashing. And then because I think yeah. that hurts people to be like, what do you mean, man? I'm struggling right now, and these yeah. people are so happy on TV yeah. and on these websites. Yeah. For each individual brain, you are new every day. You are steering. Uh, through the triumphs and the tragedies, yeah. you know, that's I think that's the bi that's a biological lesson. That that's not like some, that's like that's actually what's happening inside the electricity, yeah. the chemicals, the flesh is different every day. Yeah, God, what a good answer! And not only I I love the fact that you're able to say these things, like I said, that sound deeply spiritual, but are so based in facts and science right? yeah but it's that's, amazing but that's the bonkers thing man yeah it's the actual biology and electricity and chemicals inside each of one of our skulls is more magical more spiritual than than we have ever imagined yeah. you know yeah there therein lies the liberation of like like there's that old thing with the skeletons looking at the skull like mm -hmm. like think about all of this you know and i think and then that can bridge the divide too where there's like the the people who are concrete thinkers and the people who are spirit. No, 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 yeah, no, no, yeah, no, no. Yeah. We're all of it at the same time. We're none of it at the same time. Yeah. We're brand new every day, but let's not be clueless. The world is a is always changing around us as we are changing. And that ad adaptive, steerable component gives me hope. Yeah. And that's what I learned from the patients. Yeah. They get up and they go to these clinic visits, man. They don't know what their scans are going to show. Mm -hmm. They sit there patiently. Well, your scans look good today. <sighs> Can you imagine every yeah. three months just finding out? What part, how much, how much cancer is left? They yeah. call it cancer burden. Yeah. Not, I mean, the time is another question, but like, what am I, what are, how do the spots looking inside me that are trying to eat me up from the inside? Yeah, yeah, So yeah. if they show up and they still have stories of celebrating birthdays, so they're in, steering to enjoy life, yeah. but they're braced for that hit in clinic, they are steering to endure potential tragedy. Yeah. I mean, tragedy. Yeah. That's what, uh, that, that, uh, that dynamic nature of things is what I have learned from my journey in working at a cancer yeah. center. Gosh, incredible, thank you. Um, okay, last one. This is a fun little question. Mm. You can prescribe anything to the whole world for 30 days and they all have to do it. That's the sort of mm. cool thing about it. What do you make everyone do? And the world is not trapped in a rave or something in, in San Francisco in 1980s. Nope, right? well, some people yeah. are raving, some yeah. people are. <laughs> All of it? Yeah. Well, that's a great question. Um, I, I think um, I think it's got to be free-ish, yep. ubiquitous. And uh, what I would say is everybody with a phone or everybody near a phone has got to have, um, uh, you know, has got to download the world's least expensive app for one penny. Mm -hmm. That's like a clicker, you know, like, like for musicians, they've got something that clicks on a beat. Mm -hmm. And to just set a certain time, 15 minutes a day, in your car, in your bed, where there's controlled, deep, meditative breathing. Yeah. Three seconds in, hold, three seconds out. Yeah. And I, I could feel it. 15 minutes a day of that force for 30 days. And I just feel like, like there'd be some clarity. Yep. Now what we do with it, I mean, maybe the bad <laughs> yeah. guys would get clarity <laughs> and get an advantage. I'm not out <laughs> there for the outcome. Yeah. But I think that would take away a lot of this frenetic 
frenetic energy we've got going on right yeah. now, and that would be non-pharmacological. Yep. You ain't got to swallow a pill for that, man. Yeah. You know, you can think yourself differently. Yeah. Um, and that would be my, um, that would be the prescription, brother. Huge. There it is, man. Listen, I can't thank you enough. This was incredibly insightful. Um, and I feel fired up right now, man. Thank you. Appreciate it, man. Good stuff. Guys, if you like that and you want to see more like it as well as vlogs, other web series, and all the random stuff that I'm doing here on YouTube, don't forget to click that subscribe button. You won't regret it. I promise.